This is the 2010 Ontario, Ontario Winter Bible School. Our speaker this evening is Brother Paul Billington from the Brantford Ecclesia. His subject is the Amazing English Bible, and our reading was taken from Isaiah 55. Hear the word of Yahweh, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Amazing words, brethren and sisters. Amazing because that is exactly what has happened. Our title is The Amazing English Bible, and truly it is amazing in many different ways. Though not a perfect translation, I believe there are reasons for seeing this as the result of providence. First, we have to recognize the fact that it has survived for 400 years in spite of the many attempts to get rid of it. It is only since World War II, in fact, that it has had any credible com competition at all. It cost hundreds of lives. It has a direct impact, has had a direct impact upon British history and has been a major influence in the whole of the English speaking world all over, all over the globe. It has been a bestseller for centuries, making publishing history the King James Version is still the third most widely sold Bible in terms of numbers today. Its strong influence on British and American statesmen over the years contributed to the latter-day political restoration of the Jewish state. And it all started many years ago by a man who worked here, and his name was John Wycliffe. That is the church in Lutterworth, England, where John Wycliffe did his early translation work. He translated the scriptures into an English dialect from the Latin Vulgate of Jerome. That was in the 1300s. Not easy reading for you and I, perhaps, but really it was a work of art and in those days of course people had to copy the scriptures out by hand and uh, it is interesting to note that Wycliffe and his followers which were known as the Lollards believed in the restoration of Israel. They denied the doctrine of transubstantiation and identified the papal system as being the Antichrist. Yes, it's tough reading for us, brothers and sisters. The writing was a work of art. Wycliffe's work was not appreciated too well. This is an illustration from John Fox's Acts and Monuments. After Wycliffe died, they dug him up, burnt his bones, and then threw the ashes into the River Swift at Lutterworth. That was in 1384. Not much of a reward, reward for his work. And there is the River Swift as it still flows through Lutterworth to this day. It was to be another 141 years before William Tyndale published his translation <coughs> of the New Testament in 1525. Some years ago, Brother Frank Abel and I had the opportunity to visit the place where, uh, where Tyndale did his early translating work. And uh, it was, in fact, at Little Sodbury in Gloucestershire 
that we found the manor house and just behind the manor house there's still standing this archway which they tell us is the archway, the doorway into the little chapel where Tyndale used to preach to the family that, that uh, hired him there. And the manor is still uh, standing and it is in the upstairs room uh, of that central uh, part of the building there is where they say that the work started. They still call it, the people who live there call it the Tyndale Room. And um, according to Tyndale's biographer, Demaeus, Tyndale did the first translations in that upper room. Here he promised to make the boy that driveth the plough know more of scripture than the clergy of that time. Here is William Tyndale's 1525 translation. It's not a very good picture because it was taken from a, a video clip. Uh, we were fortunate enough to see it in the British Museum uh, and at that time Tyndale had copies of this Bible. I think there's only two, as far as I know, there's only two surviving copies and he had them smuggled into England. This particular copy, uh, so we're told, uh, belonged to Anne Boleyn, the, uh, the wife of King Henry VIII. And we were able to locate a reproduction copy of William Tyndale's 1525 uh, version. And we brought it along, and it's on the very end of that table opposite me there uh, for you to have a look at. So, copies of the Tyndale's work came into England. He translated the Bible. He also did many other works, uh, which were explaining the Bible. And John Fox, who lived 1516 to 1587, so he was contemporary with Tyndale for some time, he wrote this in his Acts and Monuments. These books of William Tyndale being compiled published and sent over into England, it cannot be spoken what a door of light they opened to the eyes of the whole English nation, which before were many years shut up in darkness. We must remember that at this particular time it was illegal to own a copy of the scriptures in English. Fox records the decree that was made by the king at this time on the screen I'll read it this is just part of it first that from henceforth no man woman or person of what estate condition or degree soever he or they be shall after the last day of August next ensuing receive have take or keep in his or their possession the text of the New Testament of Tyndale's or Coverdale's translation in English but shall, before the last day of August next coming, deliver the same English book or books to the mayor, bailiff, or chief constable of the town to the intent that the said bishop may cause them incontinently to be openly burned, which thing the king's majesty's pleasure is. So he goes on to say that if you were caught with a copy, then uh, you could expect the capital punishment uh, that the king may have pleasure in. And so it was at this time that many copies were burnt. These are engravings, of course, that, were, that come out of uh, Fox's work and, and, and other, just showing how that they did burn the Bible in, at that time. Tyndale had to flee and he went and lived over in the, on the continent. And finally they caught up with him and he was imprisoned in Vilvoord, Belgium. Tyndale wrote this letter while he was in prison. It is a remarkable letter, brothers and sisters, and I'm quite sure that uh, you will recognize some echoes to another letter from somebody else. I'm going to read you part of the translation. The letter itself is in Latin, so I'm reading you part of the translation. 
I believe, he wrote, right worshipful, that you are not ignorant of what has been determined concerning me by the Council of Brabant. Therefore, I entreat your Lordship, and that by the Lord Jesus, that if I am to remain here, he means in Vilvord, during the winter, you will request the procurer to be kind enough to send me from my goods, which he has in his position, possession, a warmer cap, for I suffer extremely from cold in the head, being afflicted with perpetual catarrh, which is considerably increased in this cell. A warmer coat also, for that which I have is very thin. Also a piece of cloth to patch my leggings. My overcoat is worn out. My shirts are also worn out. He has a woolen shirt of mine, if he would be kind enough to send it. I have also with him leggings of thicker cloth for putting on above. He also has a warmer cap for wearing at night. I wish also his permission to have a lamp in the evening, for it is wearisome to sit alone in the dark. But above all, I entreat and beseech your clemency to be urgent with the procurer that he may kindly permit me to have my Hebrew Bible, Hebrew grammar, and Hebrew dictionary, that I may spend my time with that study. And in return, may you obtain your dearest wish, provided always it is consistent with the salvation of your soul. But if before the end of the winter a different decision be reached concerning me, I shall be patient, abiding the will of God to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, whose spirit, I pray, may ever direct your heart. Amen. I don't know what effect that has on you, brothers and sisters. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul when he wrote to Timothy. And when I think of that man doing all that work and sitting in that dark cell, it brings tears to my eyes, to be quite frank. It is incredible that these are the people and this is what they have gone through so that you and I, brothers and sisters, can have a Bible. So that you and I can have the privilege of doing our daily readings. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. In Vilvord you can see this monument. It's in a little parkway there. And uh, it's the monument to Tyndale uh, which commemorates his work and his death in the year 1536. When Tyndale died, he hadn't quite finished his work. So it was continued by Miles Coverdale, who completed the work after Tyndale's death. But the question all the time is, as we look at these things, brothers and sisters, is a question for us, is how much do we value the scripture today? You know, I'm convinced that if brothers and sisters spent as much time with their Bible in front of them as what they do, the computer screen or the TV screen, our whole spiritual strength would be much greater than what it is. But the answer's in our own hands, brothers and sisters. How much time do we give to this priceless treasure that is within easy reach and access to us? Most of us have probably got several copies, several translations even, they gave their lives and their freedom. All we have to give is our time. John Rogers published what is known as the Matthews Bible in 1537. And again, we have a reproduction of that Bible here this evening. It is the second one in. Tyndale is the one furthest away. Then comes the Matthew's Bible, which was published by John Rogers at that time, another man who lost his life for his labors. Um, his work was really a reproduction of the work of Tyndale and Coverdale, which he put together and called it Matthew's Bible for, well, there's, there's lots of speculation as to why that was. Time went on. 
And coming up was a young lady by the name of Princess Elizabeth. She was to be Elizabeth I of England. Princess Elizabeth, the future Elizabeth I, was a Bible reader. She would certainly have been brought up to identify with the church's Bishop's Bible. That's this one near me, that's the title page. But she is said to have had a tutor who was actually a Huguenot, that's a French Protestant. And she was introduced to the Geneva Bible. And again, we have with us this evening here on the table for you to see a Geneva Bible. Uh, this particular uh, copy uh, was printed in 1607, so it's quite a, a valuable Bible. This was just as scholars were working on the new version that King James had ordered. So this was being printed at that time. It took some time for King James's Bible to take over from the Geneva. Uh, the Geneva Bible, as you may know, uh, was the Bible used by the Puritans uh, and was widely used among the early settlers in America, the Geneva Bible. And you can have a look at a copy of it uh, over there. This particular one has in the front the Geneva, sometimes called the Breaches Bible, by the way, because uh, there's a translation there, you know, in Genesis when they sewed aprons together, uh, Adam and Eve, well, it translates as breaches. So uh, I always thought it'd be difficult to sew leaves together to make aprons. I think it would be a lot more difficult to sew leaves together to make a pair of breeches, but that, by the way, anyway. Uh, the Geneva Bible as I say, was used quite extensively by the, uh, by the Pilgrim Fathers, in fact, that came over to uh, America. Anyway, it was the Puritans who really wanted a replacement to the Bishop's Bible, which the church was using. They saw it as inadequate, they saw it as a bad translation, uh, a bad re rendition, and so it was that, having just newly come to the throne, King James called a conference which was to be held uh, in, um, sorry, to be held here in Hampton Court uh, on the River Thames in England. And King James called this conference and all his bishops and people came and they, they met at this Hampton Court. If ever you get the opportunity, it's worth a visit to go to Hampton Court. Uh, you'll see a lot there about King Henry VIII and, and so on and so forth, but... Um, that's the time. But it was at that conference there that a, that a leading Puritan by the name of John Reynolds suggested to the king that a new translation of the Bible should be produced. And so there is the entrance into Hampton Court. Above in the tower there you can see the clock which is said to have been put there by Henry VIII. Uh, and so he collected all the England's best scholars and everyone together uh, to do this. Now James, of course, had his own political reasons for seeing to it that this work was undertaken. And so it was in the Great Hall of Hampton Court, that's what it looks like today, it's actually been renovated and changed somewhat since the, since the time of James, but nonetheless that is what it's like there today. And uh, that is where the decision was made that this King James Version should, um, should be produced. Not everybody liked the idea of King James's new Bible. And there was quite a bit of effort to stop it. Especially, you have to realize that at this time, it was a very controversial time in British history, particularly between Catholics and Protestants at this particular time. And so it was that uh, the Catholics took a great dislike to the idea of this new Bible. As a matter of fact, in 1610, just the year before, they came out with their own version 
very good at just pipping it to the post. They came out in 1610, whereas the King James came out in 1611. So they pipped him to the post, but the Reims Bible, which they produced, um, that it never really did take off that well, apart from amongst Roman Catholics themselves. Their authority, you see, was the Pope, not the Bible. And that's the big difference. The Bible authorized by the king constituted a challenge, and, and, and even today you will be told that it wasn't really authorized. And, well, there's always an element of truth in these things, but there was one answer to this that they didn't like. There's one thing that they got to do. And the answer was, 1605, assassinate the king. And so it was that there was a plot. It's known as the gunpowder plot in 1605 uh, to blow up the houses of parliament whilst James, his family, and his, uh, and his uh, lords and nobles and, and everyone were all assembled there uh, in, in the parliament building. And so that plot was, was actually hatched in this building here in Dunchurch, uh, a photograph for which I'm indebted to Brother Don Pierce, who sent it to me uh, a, a few weeks ago. So this is where the pl plot was hatched, and it was here that they waited for news to see if the plot had succeeded and that King James was no more. But unfortunately, it didn't work out, and uh, they, they caught the conspirators, one of whom was... Um, Guy Fawkes, I'm going to use this after all, see, over there, that's, that's Guy Fawkes. Uh, to English people, they'll know a lot about Guy Fawkes, and they have a lot to do with bonfire night and fireworks and all like that, but it's to commemorate this event, brothers and sisters, that uh, this man is so famous for. But they met here at Dunchurch, and most of the plot was worked out in that building. Um, the plan was to blow them all sky high, as you might say. And had that plot succeeded, there probably would never have been a King James Bible. It probably wouldn't have come into existence because they had plans to put a Catholic on the throne and, and so on and so forth. One comment comes from this little booklet. It's a Reader's Digest uh, publication. This is the heritage of Britain. But what they have to say here is this, that in commanding 54 scholars in 1604 to make a new translation of the Bible, James launched a work which was to be both the inspiration and bane of his kingdom. It goes on that the scholars worked in groups at Oxford, Cambridge, Westminster, and by 1611, they were able to present the king with the fruits of their labors, describing the holy writ as the inestimable treasure which excelleth all the riches of the earth. There's an interesting aside to this for us Canadian people. And, and it's this, that um, at this particular time, King James was extending his influence and it reached a place, you might have heard of it, it's called Newfoundland. And it was there that uh, he set up a, well, I'll read to you what's on the, uh, on the uh, screen when I put it there. There it is. Uh, under the royal permission, John Guy colonized the island in 1610. With 39 people, he faced wilderness and pirates to build the English birthplace of Canada. On May, the, on May 1610, King James issued a royal charter which authorized the incorporating and subsidizing of the company of adventurers and planters of the cities of London and Bristol for the purpose of colonizing the eastern southern parts of the new found land between 46 and 52 degrees latitude. Later, John Guy and 39 settlers set sail for Canada. The interesting thing there, brothers and sisters, is that when they settled, and being the sort of society it was at that time, it's almost certain they would have brought with them Bibles. And for certain, probably a bishop's Bible, because that was the official one, but also the Geneva uh, would have 
come here to Cooper's Cove in uh, Newfoundland. They would soon have also had the King James Bible there, so it wasn't long before uh, the shores of Canada were graced with the King James Bible. Following on the quotation from uh, the Heritage of Britain, they say that the king knew well that such treasures are potent stuff. He hoped that his new translation, produced in fertile cooperation by Puritan ministers and Anglican bishops, would become a source of national unity. He was after some form of ecumenism or whatever you want to call it. And it was by no means, though, a perfect translation, brothers and sisters. We have to recognize that. As Brother Thomas wrote in the Herald uh, in 1852, it's page 216 if you want it, uh, he wrote, the world will never behold a critically uh, trustworthy version of the Bible till the Lord comes. So all these translations that we have out there in English, there isn't one of them that you can say, that's it, 100%. And so uh, that was Brother Thomas's view, and um, I'm quite sure that he was right. It goes on, ironically, the new Bible was not a source of peace. Its immediate impact was to encourage individual conscience and individual judgment. Boy, what a problem that's been ever since. That's the problem, isn't it? Governments and churches have sought to control the minds of men, but the Bible sets men's minds free of human control. And so you see, the mark or stamp of the system to be placed upon the forehead became very, very difficult to do once the open Bible was in, 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 amongst people. It's Barbara Tushman in her book, Bible and Sword, that says this. With the translation of the Bible into English and its adoption as the highest authority, and that's important to recognize that it became the highest authority, not the Pope anymore, no church people as such, the Bible became the highest authority for an autonomous English church, the history, traditions, and moral law of the Hebrew nation became part of the English culture, became for a period of three centuries the most powerful single influence on that culture. After the publication of the King James Version in 1611, the adoption was complete. And the effect upon British culture, brothers and sisters, was tremendous. It was the laws of the Bible and so on, uh, were, were reflected in the laws of the country and in the judicial system and, and so on and so forth. The, Lord, the Lord's work was to declare this amongst the nations and in, in the isles afar off. I'd like you to turn, turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 49. In Isaiah chapter 49, we read this. And I'm reading the first six verses. Isaiah 49. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. Yahweh hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me as a polished shaft. In, the quiver, in his quiver hath he hid me and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with Yahweh and my work with my God. And now saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb, to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. So you can see it's reflecting to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So it uh, formed me from the womb, he, uh, uh, to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of Yahweh my God, and shall be my strength. 
And he said, verse 6, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. And so it is, brothers and sisters, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, a very light thing that he should restore again the kingdom to Israel, as we've been talking about in our classes this week. It's a very light thing. It isn't just that. He's also going to uh, be a light to the Gentiles. And the English Bible was just that. It was a light to the Gentiles. The Lord's work is with Israel, we know, and that is where he's going to, uh, he is the saviour of Israel, and he's going to restore, restore them again. Uh, but this Bible, you remember it says there that he's made his mouth like a sharp sword, and so it was a very controversial book. It still is a very controversial book, the Bible. And so it was that it brought about a separation between England and Rome, especially. Through the English Bible also have been called out of the Gentiles in these last days a people for the name. And they are known as the Christadelphians. It's all the work of the English Bible as far as we are concerned. That is where we, uh, that is where we found our hope from, the English Bible. Yes, brethren have gone into the original langu languages and so on and so forth and, and we're thankful for that uh, to point out where it was necessary. And so it is for those of you who are interested, by the way, the Royal Mint has produced a coin to, uh, commem to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. I don't have an awful lot to say about it other than the fact that it is available and if you want to find out their website you can probably buy a copy. I don't think it's very expensive but it is a limited edition. One of the most amazing things to my mind about the English Bible, quite apart from its history and how we got it and, and, and all like that, is the incredible influence that it has had over the world. As amazing as the English Bible has been, brothers and sisters, its widespread influence just blows you away. Especially as it seems to be something that was foretold. We, 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 I read it out at the very beginning of the, of the address this evening. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say... And you see, it, it wasn't just that it was going to be declared in the isles afar off, wasn't just that, but there's a specific message that came with it. And that message was, he that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. And that message got through to the English-speaking world of uh, a century and a half ago. It was declared in the isles afar off. Isles afar off, what does that mean? Well, if you look up the word in Strong's Concordance, it's the number 339, if those of you who uh, like to look up these things, uh, it, the, the word refers to dry land, a coast, or an island. Jesenius' Hebrew lexicon says it means inhabited land as opposed to water, the sea and rivers, maritime land. Uh, whether the seacoast of a continent or an island, especially the seashore. The Companion Bible uh, defines it as coastlands or maritime countries. But we get the general idea, don't we? Coastlands are far off. And so it is, I believe, that this could well refer to places like the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, places far off from the uh, original source. And so it would, could well point to those young lions that we read of in Ezekiel 38 and verse 13. That's what it seems to mean, distant, far off maritime lands. In any event, there was a specific message for these isles and it had to do with God's purpose in regathering Israel. 
This, to my mind, is really quite amazing how that this works out. Because there is a purpose in God's word. We know the general purpose, but there's other things that come into it as well. So we had read this evening Isaiah 55, but just to pick out this section in Isaiah chapter 55, where it tells us, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And as you go through that chapter, you see that the purpose eventually is to restore again Israel. And as Barbara Tushman uh, noted in her book, it's a curious irony that the Jews retrieved their homeland partly through the operation of the religion, or the book, that they gave the Gentiles. This message, brothers and sisters, was heard. You can see up there uh, a book, and this book was printed in, when was it? Uh, 1649, I think it says. I have the copy of that book at home. Israel's Redemption. And it goes on through that book to show, it doesn't mean to say he got everything right. No, of course he didn't. But the idea was that this idea of Israel's redemption was promoted through the knowledge of the Bible. Other books also by other writers like Joseph Mead, for example, uh, uh, Pierre Jurieu and, and, and others uh, of the, in, in the 1600s all pointed to the restoration of the nation of Israel. It's a fantastic impact that the English Bible had on that people. And so people really believed in it, and it, 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 it affected statesmen so that they would be willing to consider an amazing thing. You probably wouldn't see it today, but at that particular time, they were willing uh, and indeed eager to promote the idea of a Jewish national home uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. And so came about the... Balfour Declaration and the British mandate that followed it. An incredible influence that led to these things amongst these people. This is a, this is a lecture that we sometimes give in the United Kingdom. We gave that one a little while ago. Uh, Britain, Israel and the Bible. It still has an incredible message. It's a message, of course, which we didn't invent Brother Thomas 70 years before the Balfour Declaration had said from Scripture how that these things would come about. And they did come about. It's incredible, brothers and sisters, that it, that, that was the case. The, the, there's two quotations at the bottom here that I'd just like to read to you. Uh, one is from Benjamin Disraeli. And he says that the Lord deals with nations as the nations deal with the Jews. And time and time again, that's been proved true. Winston Churchill, we owe the Jews in the Christian revelation a system of ethics which, even if it were entirely separated from the supernatural, would be in, in, com, it's got a bend in the thing, incomparably the most precious possession of mankind, worth in fact the fruits of all other wisdom and learning put together. That was Winston Churchill. So you can see what an impact this book had upon the English nation at those, that particular time. Not just the English nation, but the United States as well. Going back to about the same period, US President Wilson in 1919 had this to say. As for Palestine, I have expressed my approval of the declaration of the British government regarding the aspirations and historic claims of the Jewish people in regard to Palestine. He says, I am persuaded that the allied nations with the fullest concurrence of our own government and people are agreed that in Palestine shall be laid the foundations of a Jewish commonwealth. The hand of providence had worked through the English Bible to influence the British people and now the American people 
and also it spread out to the Australians and the New Zealanders and so on and so forth. And so that is what happened and it brought about the purpose that God had designed. Now you may say to me, well, Britain is not so committed to the Jewish homeland today as she was in 1919 and 1917-18. The United States may be less enthusiastic now under Barack Obama. That's not the point, brothers and sisters. Don't let's miss the point. The point is that the purpose has been achieved. Today there is a state of Israel. It was brought about via these means. So the purpose was accomplished. And once it was accomplished, that was it. The... Um, the uh, I was going to say the power of Tyre was cast out of the land, but <laughs> that, 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 that really is what happened. And so, even, I say today, no, it's when I was a boy, there was the coronation of Elizabeth II. She was actually crowned in 53, though she became queen in 62. But at that coronation ceremony, with all the grandeur and, the, and, 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 the, and the, the, the pomp and everything that's there, she is presented with a Bible. And these are the words that are said to her, or were said to her on that occasion. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing this life affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. It was an authorized version, brethren and sisters. It wasn't the New English Bible. It wasn't any of the other fancy ones that you get today. And so it was that she was introduced to this and she was asked, will you solemnly promise to swear to govern the peoples of Great Britain, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, according to their respective laws and customs and so on and so on. And she answers, all this I promise to do. But the book was the King James Authorized Bible. The modern translations, brothers and sisters, for all that they might offer us, could not capture the sense of occasion and the grandeur that was the case with the King James Version. There's nothing can equal it as far as the English language is concerned, even though it's out of date. People say that they don't like the old English, but let's be honest, everybody knows what thou means and what thee means and, and all these things. It isn't as though we are uh, talking gibberish or double Dutch or something. We all know what it means. And so, brothers and sisters, there is a tremendous opportunity for us here as the world recognizes the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Some of us in the Brantford Ecclesia have been assembling an exhibition together and I brought along a few pieces to show you tonight so that on the table you will see at the far end you'll see a reproduction of the William Tyndale Bible these 1525, then there is a reproduction of the Matthews Bible, and then there is a Geneva Bible, an actual copy of the Geneva Bible, and here closest to me, there is actually a King James uh, New Testament, all that which we hope to use in the, in the exhibition. We hope to have it all ready by the spring. We hope that it will include, a lot of the work is already done, we have a full-size replica of the Isaiah scroll, and it's, some of you will have already seen it, it's in a sort of a circular um, sort of display cabinet that we put up, and so we will, have the, uh, we will have the Isaiah scroll then, it's a reproduction obviously, they wouldn't let us have the real one. Um, I should have asked Lane to go and ask to borrow it. <laughs> uh, reproduction Bibles, such as the ones that are here, the, the, the actual older Bibles are here. Uh, things like the chained Bible. We've brought the stand uh, along, uh, which was uh, 
put together. On that tonight, you'll see a Fox's Book of Martyrs that's, that we've put on there uh, for you to see. So there's, lo there's lots of things that we're going to include in this exhibition. And if any of you are interested and think that your ecclesias might be able to make use of this, uh, please have a word with us. There's several uh, inquiries already, so obviously slots have to be booked and so on and so forth. But um, we would encourage you to use this as a means of witness in this period in which we live. Um, it should be ready in the spring. Uh, and so what we need to do is to lift our voice in witness to the truth, loud and clear, brothers and sisters, in these closing times of the Gentiles that we are living in today. Behold, says Jesus, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. That's the message for us today. That's speaking to you and to me, brothers and sisters. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked. What a study there is in just those words there. To keep our garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. May we take that message to heart, brothers and sisters. May we help one another wherever and however we can as we look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Anybody's welcome to step up and have a look at these uh, pieces that we've put out.